This is Woburn Safari Park. Home to some of the most endangered wildlife on the planet. 600 animals, 76 different species. For the first time, the park allows access all areas. From dangerous carnivores to fragile newborns. In unparalleled close encounters. In today's program, desperate measures are taken to stop conflict amongst the lions. Keepers fear for the safety of a newborn litter of wolves. And there's a life or death operation for an old lemur. Deep in the rural English countryside lies Woburn Safari Park. The wild animals at the park can be dangerous. If they need relocating or medical help, handling them is risky. Today, one of the most ferocious animals, Rhino Otsu, needs to be sedated, and the only way to do it is to dart him. The job falls to head keeper Chris. He's the most experienced sniper in the park and has been darting animals here for 40 years. It's a dangerous business. We do use a drug um, for anaesthetics that is extremely powerful, um, but unfortunately it's fatal in man. The drug is ideal to anaesthetize large animals. The keepers need to stay out of range. I carry an antidote with me at all times, and the safety team have had training um, to back me up in the event of an accident. Safety during darting is taken very seriously. But Chris faces other problems too. Some of the animals have wised up to him. Whenever I arrive in my Land Rover, a lot of the animals, you know, they recognize me. And um, they think, oh no, here he is, what's up? Um, what's he up to this time? And I have had to go to the extreme of using um, camouflage, um, even to, the, to the, the extreme of wearing a wig. Um, so they don't realize me. But it works. It does the job, so. Chris may seem calm when he's darting, but he has to keep his nerve. If I'm honest, I still get nervous. I still get the adrenaline rush. And I still have to control breathing and heart rate, so... Um, but you have to do these things in order to do the job successfully. Chris's experience is about to be put to the test. Powerful bull rhino Otzi is due to move to a new park in Denmark in 24 hours. Unpredictable bad behavior towards public cars at Woburn means he's had to be quarantined. He'll be traveling in a huge steel crate, which his keeper of 10 years, Nick, has been trying to train him to enter. This mighty mammal has taken tentative steps, but he's refusing to get in. We really need somebody to be here all the time while he's there to try and coax him in. It's not just a matter of, as you see, opening the door and, and expecting him to go in because animals don't work like that. Chris hopes that a sedative will calm him so he can be loaded safely. He's chosen a device affectionately known as a jab stick to carry out the procedure. We can put a syringe loaded with a drug into there and just physically push that into the animal and a spring-loaded trigger fires the drug into to, uh, a plunger which presses the syringe for you. The drugs have to penetrate into Otzi's deep muscle tissue. His skin is 30 millimeters thick, so force is needed. He'll get quite upset, obviously, with an ejection into his backside, so I won't be able to do it again today. So this one has got to work. Tensions are high. There's just one chance to get this right. We can get his bottom over to me. He's a boy. Right, I'm ready That's when you are, boy. so... Let's see. Go on, good boy. Teamwork is vital. Whilst Nick tempts him with food, 
Chris takes aim and plunges the dart into his hind. Job done. Good boy. Good boy. He's a good lad. Absolutely perfect. Couldn't have gone better. So he's, he's not well, steady. He's not got too wound up, so he needs to be calm now. So the, the calmer he is, the better the drug will start to work. In 12 hours' time, the drug's benefit will be at its peak. It's then that the team hope to load Otzi into the crate. It's crucial to have him crated up within the next 24 hours because obviously the law is booked, the fare is booked, um, so it's, it's then or never. The keepers can only hope that the drugs have the desired effect. The clock is ticking. If the rhino refuses to load, the whole of this vital relocation will fail. Woburn's herd of Bactrian camels are looking dishevelled. The end of the winter is causing havoc with their coats. They're molting like mad. The shedding hair doesn't help the safari park look its best. The keepers are given the runaround as they tidy the section. In the wild, these camels live in the rocky deserts of Central and East Asia, where temperatures can drop to minus 30 degrees. To endure this, they grow 25 centimeter long hair, and in the summer, they want it off. The camels will normally use items within their environment to rub up against, so rocks, fences in this case, in this paddock, um, any logs or branches we've got they'll use. When the camels are in a good mood, the keepers daringly lend a helping hand to try and speed up the malting process. Um, Sasha's trying to grab some hair off the camels here. Obviously, he's staying close to the jeep, so he's not in any sort of danger from them. And um, They've got tusks right at the back of their jaw, so they've got the ability to take your arm off if they want to. Sasha's being extremely brave trying to get hair off them. <laughs> Ten-year-old Zeke seems happy, as long as there's hay involved. He'll only take the loose bits. Obviously, he'll check, he'll start pulling on it, and if it's still attached, he won't try and get that, so they won't be happy. <laughs> it can take anything from a few weeks to several months for the camels to lose their coats. So Zeke, Norman, and Genghis will have to stay looking unkempt for a while longer. The camel's hair is in big demand. The park's carnivore section can't wait to get their hands on it. In the lemur forest, 19-year-old Mia is the oldest and weakest lemur in the group. In the wild, life expectancy for black and white roughed lemurs is around 20 years. Today, Mia is on his way to hospital. Sick animals only ever leave the park when it's serious. We noticed a week or so ago that his front upper canines were discoloured and they seemed to be a strange shape. We decided to bring him here where we can anaesthetise him and do whatever's necessary. I'm just getting the drugs drawn up ready for the sedation, so I've got the sedation drugs and also the reversal drugs, so if anything went wrong we could wake him up straight away. Got him. Susanna injects Mia with a sedative. Anaesthetizing and operating on an old animal could be fatal. There we go. When he's fully asleep, we'll bring him out and get him on oxygen and get a tube down his throat so that we can make sure he's breathing properly. Mia has succumbed to the tranquilizer. Vet Susanna wastes no time. She inserts a breathing tube to maintain airflow. There we go, Papa, I know. Specialist dental vet Jude begins by examining the teeth. It's pretty horrible, aren't they? Yes. For lemurs, teeth aren't just for eating. Their dental anatomy is unique and has evolved specifically for grooming. Yeah. 
Their incisors and canines grow forward, straight out from their jaw, forming a tooth comb. This is used to brush their fur and groom other group members. Yes, I mean, it is fused to the bone. Yeah. Well, let's get the incisors out then. I think now that I've exposed it, I'd like to try and okay. take that out. That His front canines have the, um, the pulp exposed, so they're quite painful. They're quite fused to the bones, so they are going to be difficult to remove, but if we don't remove them, then he's going to continue to be in pain. Social bonds are established and reinforced through grooming. So if you can't groom, you can become an outcast. His front incisors will probably need to come out as well, and they're the ones they used to groom with. As they begin the surgery, Mia is vulnerable and faces losing his important grooming teeth. Woburn Safari Park feeds its animals a vast one and a half tons of food every week. The creatures eat everything from vegetation to whole animal carcasses. But what goes in must come out. And there's a lot of it. It's a daily job for all the keepers to dispose of it. All the lovely food and everything comes into the park to feed the nice animals. But there is obviously a nasty side to it, and that's that. Like 200 tonnes of it that we spread out onto Heathfield um, around Christmas time. It takes us about two days to spread it, and then that then works its way back into the ground, and up we come with a nice crop of hay, hopefully, if the weather's with us. Whether it's dung, scat, boli, droppings or guano, it's all mixed together and used as fertiliser. It's the same as any farming setup, really, you know, what, what is there needs to go out there so as it's going to grow again, and it's, it is a cycle. To be effective, the dung needs to compost for a year before it's spread. So, the park alternates, filling two piles with the 200 tons of the animal's annual waste. But for the keepers, it's also important to inspect the dung to make sure the animals stay healthy. And for one of the park's elephants, this will prove vital. In the carnivore section, all is not well in the lion pride. Lowest ranking female Tallulah has been outcast. Whilst the pride stick closely together, she shyly keeps her distance from the others. The two main aggressors are lionesses Tia and Brandy. Drastic decisions have had to be made. Tallulah does get picked on quite a bit by various members of the pride, but in particular Tia and Brandy. So in order to create a better pride dynamic, we thought if we remove the two of them, hopefully it'll give Tallulah a better life. The park has found a zoo that is looking for two breeding females, and the lionesses are the perfect match. We'll separate them off. We'll put Brandy in the race, and we'll have Tia in a compartment on her own. Relocating lions is dangerous. Tia and Brandy can't just be sedated. They need to be fully anaesthetized. Vet Martin uses a tranquilizer gun. has penetrated Tia's rear. Whilst the drug takes effect, Martin turns his attentions to Brandy. They are all teeth and claws, and if they are slightly awake, they can cause serious damage to anyone. There's always someone who is watching them constantly, watching to see if their eyes are twitching, making sure they're still breathing, just to make sure it's a safe environment for everyone to work in. 
Within minutes, both Tia and Brandy are tranquilized. Brandy is the first to be loaded into her steel container. Weighing in at 200 kilograms, it requires a team of six people to move Tia carefully into her relocation crate. Same again. Once she's loaded, it's time for last goodbyes. We're hoping that without the two aggressors there, that Tallulah will be allowed into the pride a bit more. Now Tia and Brandy have gone, that that will sort of gel them all together and there won't be this constant sort of standoff between Tallulah and between the others in the pride. Everyone is hoping for the best outcome for Tallulah, but nobody can be certain how the rest of the pride will react. Outcasts can be ferociously attacked and even killed. The keepers will need to be on guard to intervene if the pride turns on her. The four Asian elephants add the most manure to the park's 200-ton pile. They tend to eat 70 kilos of food a day and um, they're drinking somewhere up to 40 litres of water and out the other end of dung from our four elephants and the elephants produce seven litres of, of urine a day as well. They digest just 40% of what they eat and their dung gives away nutritional clues. In the dung you can see the hay, the grass come out, sometimes you can see the leaves from the tree branches that we provide them in an evening and often you can see whole pieces of fruit that have gone right through the digestive system and come out the other end. Other than cause a mountain of mess, the dung provides clues to their state of health. But we can also tell how healthy they are because of what's coming through the dung, what they're able to digest, what they're taking their nutrients from. There is one elephant whose dung appears different to the others. 32-year-old Yusin has a problem. What you can see is you've got a lot larger pieces of hay in Yusin's dung, and we know that this is Yusin's because her teeth can't digest the food quite as well. So the balls have come out together, and the hay is a lot larger in pieces, whereas for fe the younger females, we've got a lot more shredded hay, and they're in these nice small boli. Boli is the name for ball-shaped dung created by the elephants. With this evidence of Yusin's eating problems, the team will need to try and keep a close eye on her teeth. In the wolf den, the pack dynamic has been changing. There are four Iberian wolves. With her distinguished folded over ear, Mum Dora and Dad Diego lead the group. Siblings Carlos and Carmen are one year old. Iberian wolves breed just once a year and their mum, Dora, is pregnant again. She's been close to giving birth. Her teeth and abdomen are swollen. In the Iberian wolf pen, we've been basically waiting for any signs that Dora was going to be giving birth. Wolves give birth secretly in underground dens. Dora has dug her den in the bank with two entrances and tunnels that extend three meters below the surface. She recently disappeared underground. Diego is protecting the den site. Once they're born, cubs spend six weeks below ground before facing daylight. Wolves are fiercely protective, and the keepers cannot get close. They've been watching from afar for signs. The last couple of days we've seen her out and about again looking for food, and she's looking a lot skinnier than she was before she went, so hopefully that means she's successfully given birth. Wolves can cannibalize their own pups. Nobody knows if any cubs are even alive. Um, there's not really any way of telling how many she's had or how they're doing, because they will be so far in the den. Um, 
We just have to trust that she'll be a good mum and take care of them and they should start to pop out and we'll get a look at them. The wolves are the most elusive species at the park. The keepers will be watching from a distance in the hope of finally spotting signs of new life. In the operating theatre, 18 miles from Woburn Safari Park, 19-year-old Mia's dental surgery is underway. He's an old lemur, and operations of any kind carry serious risks. So far, vet Jude has needed to remove one of Mia's badly damaged canines and the all-important front grooming teeth. In the jungles of his native Madagascar, this tooth problem would have killed Mia. In a while, they have to, you know, pretend that they're absolutely fine because otherwise they won't get to eat <laughs> and they will get, go down the social hierarchy if they show any signs of illness. There is some positive news. Mia's back teeth are in good order and won't need to be removed. But as she probes Mia's jaw, the vet's fears about his remaining canine are confirmed. It's just crumbling. Yeah. This one doesn't feel as fused. It appears two of his canines are damaged, so Jude will need to remove both of them. We've not got a nice smooth surface like a cat or a dog. Lovely. Okay. Beautiful. Today we've taken out uh, six teeth altogether, two canines and four incisors, the small teeth at the front. The, both the canine, uh, canines are damaged. One was um, fractured, unfortunately. I think he would have been in quite a lot of pain. There is um, a nerve that's exposed in both of the canines, and so that would just go, as in humans, straight up. So it would have been painful, but they hide it very well. Um, now these teeth are removed, I don't think he'll be in any pain anymore, which is good. Excellent. The operation is complete. It's time to try and bring Mia back to consciousness. We've injected him into the muscle rather than vein because we quite like him to come around slowly because of what he's been through. So it can take between sort of five and ten minutes really until they're um, awake enough so that we can take the tube out and then put him back in the box. He's just, we just keep him on oxygen at the moment. <laughs> there we go, lovely. With the breathing tube removed, Vet Susanna pumps oxygen into the box yeah. to kickstart his senses. Um, his, blood, his blood results look pretty good. His glucose levels are a little high, but the stress of the whole procedure is um, going to have increased that. It's not high enough to indicate diabetes. Um, and other than that, everything is to be expected in a healthy primate of his age. So it's really good. Better than I was expecting them to be, actually, so that's great. And it's also a thumb up from Mia. He survived the operation. His next challenge looms. He needs to try and eat and integrate back into the group. Back at the safari park, the camel's winter coat rags have made their way over to the carnival section. I am stuffing a hessian sack full of camel wool for the tigers. So they really like really strong scents. Amy is hoping to use the wool to keep the tiger's natural wild instincts alive. This is olfactory enrichment, basically scent enrichment. What tigers will do when they see different scents in the wild is they'll mark on it, basically, or they'll try to cover themselves in it. If it's a prey animal, for example, they go and find uh, deer dung out in the wild, they'll roll all around in it, and it masks their own scent so they can get a little bit closer to the prey when they eventually go and hunt. Tara is also preparing a wool sack, but for another species. 
The Canadian wolves have never smelt camel fur. It's an animal that they wouldn't normally come across in their natural habitat, so it's going to give them a bit of enrichment to pick up a new scent, something that's not out in the enclosure already. Amy is giving her tiger's sack a little extra kick. In my other half, I had quite a few of one particular aftershave, and I knew that tigers like different scents, and I said to him one evening, like, is there any aftershaves that you don't want anymore? And he asked me, oh, yeah, you can take this, that, and the other, and they absolutely loved it. They do seem to like the male smell more than the female smell, which is probably why it's two girls. <laughs> I'm literally covering this hessian sack with as much aftershave as I possibly can just to make it really smelly. Stinking sacks complete. What's this? And it's over to the predators. In the Lima forest, Mia has returned from hospital and rejoined the group. Keeper Leanne has come to check up on him. It's up to her to nurse the patient back to health. With his sore mouth, Mia has not yet eaten. Mia, come in. There's a little bit of squabbling just because obviously he's been to the vets um, for a few hours, so he smells a little bit different. Um, but that's completely normal behaviour to see. So, um, but he seems to be doing okay. We've got to try and get um, Mia's medication into him. Uh, which can be very difficult with lots of greedy lemurs around. Hopefully he'll take it. Leanne sneakily slips one of the lemurs a placebo so she can give Mia his medication in a sandwich. And what I've got is just a little bit extra for the other ones that are hanging around me at the moment. Mia manages to devour his first meal, no trouble. This old lemur is on the road to recovery. But the keepers will monitor Mia closely to ensure the group doesn't bully him and that his coat remains clean. For now, Mia is exceeding expectations. He's sticking up for himself, has started eating, and is already learning how to use his tongue for grooming. The Przewalski horse is a critically endangered subspecies of wild horse. The safari park has a herd of eight. Males reach sexual maturity when they're three years old. Young male Q is now over two. To keep the breed healthy, he cannot mate with his family. So to remain within the herd, he needs to be castrated. With his years of experience, the skills of Keeper Chris are called upon once again. He must dart Q with an anaesthetic before the operation. I want the process to be successful, quick, um, you know, good for the horse, um, so I have to be very, very careful all the time. The drug is the same type that was used on Rhino Otzi. It's fatal to humans. Chris has to be in the perfect position to get his shot. The horses are curious to know why the team are near their enclosure. There must be food. The target is in the middle of the herd. But at the crucial moment, the horses spook. The team need a new plan. Laura tries to coax the herd towards their shelter. This time, Chris is more careful to try and go unnoticed. Laura must back away before Chris takes his shot. clear and he takes aim oh. 
I wasn't totally happy with the shot, if I'm honest. Um, I like to make sure I get it right deeply into muscle. Went a little bit forward uh, and into the flank, so it could have gone slightly under the skin. If he takes too long to go down, Q will need another dart of anaesthetic. If we top him up, um, it has its risks, um, but we are on the side of caution, so we know we can give him at least another one mil quite safely. Q has separated himself off from the herd, and he starts to wobble. The other horses show concern. But 20 minutes later, Q is still not going down. Chris needs to act quickly and dart him again before the effects of the first drug begin to wear off. This time, it's a perfect shot. As soon as he goes down, the instruments will come out and it will be time for his castration. In the Przewalski horse paddock at Woburn Safari Park, young male Q has finally succumbed to the second shot of anaesthetic. The team head in to start work on his castration. They need to work fast. The Przewalski horses are carefully managed. They were once extinct in the wild, but were reintroduced to their native Mongolia. The entire world's population descend from just nine horses kept in captivity over 60 years ago. But here, Q needs to be castrated so he doesn't breed with his family. Basically, we're just removing both testicles, which are uh, not that large on him. <laughs> now he's asleep, basically, what she needs to do is just incise into the skin, remove the testicles, and ligate the arteries, and then that should be it. So something we do routinely on small animals, we do it a lot, and, you know, we do it fairly regularly on horses as well. Bet, Tally, must operate where the horse has fallen. It's vital that everything is kept sterile. We make it as clean as possible. Tally's already scrubbed it, so she's had a full surgical scrub on it, scrubbed up her hands as well. All the equipment's sterile, so now Tally's hands and that is effectively sterile. And so we cover him with antibiotics as well, keep a close eye on him afterwards. With the testicles exposed, Tally uses a specially designed tool to finish the job. <laughs> Some emasculators. So I think it's a they crush and cut at the same time. They just cut through the tunic. We just leave that on for a few seconds to stop any bleeding from that. Easier when you've got bigger hands. Q is asleep and can't feel anything, but the effects of the anaesthetic make his body shake. Through the actual Tally clamps off the arteries and the testicles are removed. Okay. Throughout the procedure, Lindsay is on guard. It could be dangerous for everyone if the herd stampede. Tally must finish quickly. The wound doesn't need to be sewn up and will heal itself. An anaesthetic spray is applied to the skin to prevent infection. Lovely. Q has been given a reversal injection to help him recover from the tranquilizer. The team back off quickly. Just be on standby, Sash, in case he goes into the fence. Susanna stays close to monitor his recovery. Come on, Trouble. Hi. Good boy. Go on, babe. <laughs> oh, dear, what's she done? Q will feel sore for a few hours, but as quickly as he can, he rejoins the other boys. In the 
the Iberian wolf section, alpha female Dora is spending more and more time out of her birthing den. She's been securing the fine cuts from dinner. It's a good sign. Wolves serve up regurgitated meat to their cubs. The keepers have had a breakthrough. Four babies have been spotted in the distance. We've seen four quite a few times now, so we're pretty happy that they will start to venture off from the den on their own. So, you know, we're happy that she's had four. We haven't been able to sex them just yet because obviously we don't want to stress them out and get them get hold of them too young or anything. So we will let mum just carry on. And then the more they spend out in the section and the pen, the, um, the easier it'll be for the staff to actually be able to sex them that way and just keep an eye on them as they go, get older. The new cubs play a crucial role in the conservation of the species. Woburn is part of the Iberian wolf breeding program, which matches breeding pairs across the world. Next year, one-year-old Carlos and Carmen will join this program at a time when they would naturally leave the group in the wild. They can go off separately to different collections and start a pack somewhere else where they can then obviously become the alpha male and female. Until then, all members have a role to play in rearing the young. For the older siblings, this means babysitting duties. Um, Dora, the mum, will raise them. The, uh, the offspring from last year have been very good, sort of supporting her with that, looking after them when they come out of the den, being playful with them and sort of teaching them how they should act and where they can go and looking after them, making sure they're safe. Like all older brothers, until he leaves the family home, it's Carlos's role to wind up his younger siblings and teach them to play rough. Following Tia and Brandy's departure, the lion keepers have laid out a fresh carcass for the pride. The aggressors have been gone for just one day, but it seems ostracized Tallulah is slowly inching her way closer to the pride. Tallulah's had a really good day. She spent virtually the entire day with all of the pride members. Uh, there's been a feed out for them, so they've all been tucking in and popping back and forward, but we haven't seen any aggression. Although Tallulah has spent an unusually peaceful day with her lion family, there's a long way to go before she can become a fully-fledged and accepted member of the Pride. The next few days are definitely going to be make and break for Tallulah. It's difficult to tell at such an early stage because today they're quite unsettled with everything that went on this morning. So once they're into the routine of knowing that Tia and Brandy aren't coming back, then we'll see the new dynamic properly settle in and see how Tallulah goes. Time will tell if peace has been restored in the Pride. Now that two of dominant male Shane's daughters have left, it's time for the lions to breed and increase their numbers again. Shane needs to make his choice from the remaining lionesses. Over with the park's herbivores, an important monthly health care check is underway for Damini and Shandrika. Other than inspecting the elephant's dung, it's vital that the keepers give their teeth a regular checkup. Head up. Head up. You need to check that they're not overgrown, that any new growth is coming through nicely, and that they've not got anything stuck in their teeth. We also check their tushes. Head up. Damini's only got one of those. That's their incisor teeth. I would check that they're nice and clean and growing all right and not overgrown because that can cause problems if it touches on their trunk as well. The elephant's teeth work on a conveyor belt system. So the new teeth come in from the back and the one at the front gets worn down. So those are two new teeth you can see at the back of the mouth that are coming in. And these are a fourth set of teeth that she's going through now. And they have six sets of teeth in their lifetime. 
Daddy. We give them lots of tree branches, which means they wear their teeth down. It's the same as giving a child a toothbrush. Asking elephants to open their mouth on demand doesn't happen instantly. But in order to train an elephant to look inside their mouth and have a nice clear view of their teeth, check that everything's okay in there, it can take a different amount of time depending on the elephant. Um, these girls, they learnt it when they were very young, so that was a little bit easier. But teaching the oldest elephant new tricks isn't easy. Yusin has been at the park for just a year. She's a powerful mammal, and she's still trying to assert her dominance. Yusin no. is incapable of chewing her food properly. She has a history of dental problems. Tooth care for her is more important than for any of the others. But checking her teeth is problematic. She's 32, and she's never been trained to open her mouth before. So the very simple thing to start off with is just to feed her in her mouth. So she sees it as a positive thing. I and mean, she's not quite uh, so wary of anybody trying to put their hands around her mouth. Then uh, one of the first things we trained her as well, just to put a trunk up. And go, he's in trunk. And go. So it keeps the trunk out of the way, so you get easier access to her mouth. And if she just gets to, to put her head up. Most elephants, if you offer them fruit, if she's used to putting uh, uh, fruit onto her tongue, she'll just drop her bottom jaw down when you put something on her tongue. And go, he's in. And that's just the way we start the process of training her through her mouth. As we go on with the training, we'll just try and put your fingers around the side of her mouth and hopefully she'll just open up, <laughs> open up the, her lips so you can actually see her teeth in there as well. And then we get a nice clear view and see how bad they are. Yusin is making progress, but bigger challenges and tougher lessons have yet to come. In the weeks ahead, the future for some of the park species begins to look uncertain. Yusin asserts her dominance as she discovers unfamiliar territories. The giraffe males begin sparring, a behavior that can be fatal. And although the dynamics of the lion pride appear to be settling, all is not what it seems. There's tragic news in store for everyone.